All right, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. I had a really fun workshop yesterday with the gang that came out for the workshop. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I really enjoyed the view last night and the cocktails, so thank you, ICMA, for such a great cocktail hour. I've been up since 3 a.m. because uh, I couldn't sleep, so I just drank coffee. So I'm talking really fast, I realize. <laughs> so if I talk too fast, just give, give me a slow down sign. Hey, calm down. Uh, <laughs> I'm on it. I will slow down. All right, we're going to talk about Unbundled, new revenue for new media. And I'm going to start by trying to get your mindset into the mind of a marketer, OK? So we're going to spend some time on that. And then I'll, I'll work with you to kind of help you think through the new online universe and how you can leverage new opportunities to drive new kinds of revenue in the online world. That's my plan. Uh, so let's get started. I, uh, I started thinking about the new media universe as a marketer. Even as a kid, uh, you know, when I look back at my childhood, I was on the swim team in Houston, Texas. Okay? I grew up in Texas. I was a swimmer. I, I originally from South Africa, which is where I learned to swim and thought that swimming was very cool. It turns out it's not that cool in Texas. But <laughs> we used to go to Pizza Hut which was a big pizza chain in the 80s, and we would eat pizza before every swim meet to carbo load, which apparently you don't do anymore, but we did it in the 1980s. And I was standing in line at the Pizza Hut with a friend of mine waiting to order pizza, and a woman came up to the, the counter, and she ordered a large pizza and a Diet Coke, and the guy behind the counter said, okay, uh, how many slices would you like that pizza cut into? And she said, eight. I could never eat 10. I was, <laughs> I, even even as, a, as a young kid, I was like, that, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. And this is the way C CMOs are thinking today, and this is the way publishers feel, I think. The marketing pie isn't getting any bigger, it's just getting sliced more ways. So we have to actually start thinking about the, the online world and all the opportunities for marketers to market and to, for brands to interact and for even users to interact as the same giant sliced pie. Here's what it looks like. I call it CMO pizza, okay? So if I'm a chief marketing officer at an organization, I I, you know, I used to have just a few slices of the pie that I would, I would think about, right? Maybe three of these. Maybe events or promotions or advertising or public relations. And I used to take my entire budget and slice it up to fit into these big pieces. But that's changed, right? All of a sudden we have the online universe where now we're spending in social media and interactive and SEO and SEM and PPC and whatever other acronyms you want to add to it. And I've still got to spend on those primary things that I've spent in a long time. And my budget hasn't gotten giant. It's changed maybe a little over time, gone up, gone down. So advertisers are buying more, but they're spending about the same, and we're getting paid less. So this is how the online world looks to me. And then there are new opportunities to advertise and market all the time. Like, have you guys talked about native advertising or heard about native advertising? Nod your heads. Yes. Okay. So native advertising, where does that fit, right? The more products and services we offer as publishers and brands on the, on the web even, we start slicing the pie an additional way, which just creates a new slice that they don't have budget for. Where do I find that budget? Does it come out of advertising? Does it come out of public relations? I don't know where to find a budget for native advertising. I don't have one. I don't have, there's not a line item. So the more we do this, the more and more we're not helping our end advertisers, our CMOs, figure out where they should get the money from for our new opportunities. Publishers in general are good at coming up with new revenue streams, but we're not good at coming up with new revenue models. Okay? And I think we need to start rethinking our revenue models, not just our revenue streams. Okay? In, the, in the publishing world, there have been two primary revenue models for the history of the, the publishing. Right? Number one, I can charge you for access to the audience. Right? That, that's, like, as an advertiser, I have a very valuable audience. I'll give you access to that. It costs money to get to my valuable audience. Or we charge the, the consumer for access to the content. Right? So subscriber model. Is there a third one? That's what I want you to start thinking about. Over the next few days here, I want you to start thinking about revenue models. What if you started fundamentally changing the way you drive revenue for your brand and your platforms? That's, I don't have the answer. I have an answer that I like, <laughs> that I'm interested in. But, and I'll share some of those with you today. But is there a third revenue model is what I want you to ask, all right? So let's talk about. The, the last decade of marketing battles that we've faced as marketers, okay? Again, this is inside the marketer's mind, and this is the evolution of value 
in the mind of the marketer. This is how it's evolved over time. The first one is the battle for attention. All right? The battle for attention is essentially a real estate game. This is, this is legitimately an offer for advertising opportunities on a media platform in the United States. They essentially tell you that there is zero content. You can buy any space on this page. This is any, you, I don't know, you want to put a half page ad right here? Go for it. You want to fill up the whole page? I don't care, we'll take away the content. If you'll pay for the space, we'll give it to you. Well, this, this ended up creating, I don't know if you guys ever saw the million dollar homepage. Did you guys see this? This is, yeah, this was a genius marketing concept, but they capitalized on the real estate game where they sold for a dollar a pixel, they sold a million pixels, and he sold out in six months. Generated a million dollars of revenue for this idiotic web page with zero content. This is what we end up with if we just play the real estate game. And as a marketer, we've all, well, I don't know, have you guys heard of banner blindness, this concept? Yeah? Okay. So this is banner blindness, right? The idea that consumers now know where to ignore advertising. They've trained themselves to consume the content in the right place. So we're looking at a heat map from people's eyeballs on a page. And this is what they look at. The red is hot, the blue is cold, the black is, I never even noticed it. Banner blindness is a real problem if we're relying on display advertising to drive revenue. We've got to start rethinking whether this works and why are our brands even buying it. Brands are starting to realize that there are better ways. This is the first banner ad in 1994. It said, have you ever clicked your mouse right here? You will. 1994, the first banner ad for AT&T's You Will campaign. In 1995, the click-through rate for, for this ad was 78% people. Seven, se, seven, that's not a typo. It's not missing a decimal point. Se, se, that's a lot of people. Today, 0.02% is a decent banner ad campaign. Well, we're doing pretty well. That was a good campaign. I mean, come on, give me a break. Raise your hand if you clicked a banner ad. Not testing, you can't count testing a banner ad on your own platform. Raise your hand if you, if you clicked a banner ad of your own volition in the last week. Keep it up. Keep, one person, one, one per, I wanna know what that banner ad is. I'll come back and talk to you afterwards. <laughs> one person. Like, this is, banner advertising is changing. Yes, it might be good for brand awareness, and we can talk about that, but it's not necessarily the best or most effective use of my, of my CMO dollars. In 1998, Google's lifespan for, for the average web, web page was 78 days, 77 days. That meant that the average web page didn't change for 77 days. So if you had a home page, you could leave it up and just not update anything for almost three months, all right? Look at it today. In 2012, the web page lifespan is 72 hours. The content is evolving so rapidly and changing so fundamentally fast that we've got to start thinking about why and where we put our display ads, whether they work or not, becomes more and more relevant, and we're wondering how often we have to change where we put it to get to the people we want. There are one billion new web pages published every single day, one billion. That's new content being crapped out on the internet that people are supposed to consume. And when you just take the IAB standards for banner ads, just this one opportunity, this is nine billion new opportunities to advertise every single day. Nine billion. That makes me think, I'm no economist, but this is what I understand about economics. If supply goes up, uh, and we have unlimited, <laughs> infinite, nine billion new opportunities every day to advertise, we're screwed if we're going to rely, rely on display advertising as the revenue model to drive us towards the future and future success. This can't last. We end up with duplicated content and we end up being screwed at the end of the day. So the first battle is all about advertising value, valuing the quantity of impressions over the quality of the audience we were going after. So as a CMO, all we worried about was the impressions we got and, and, and we want a huge volume, okay? Today, we've got to rethink this. This is the battle to be next to your content. The content being created by your users, your environment, your content next to a valuable piece of real estate. All right, so that's the first battle, the battle for attention, the real estate game. You guys doing okay? All right. This is the second one, the battle for the conversation, all right? So all of a sudden, we started to realize there was a new opportunity to interact when brands like Forbes, any brand, 
started having the opportunity to comment, okay? Blogs were infamous for having these wonderfully long conversations about products and services and opportunities and new ideas, all strung from one piece of content created by an influential person who ended up sparking this and igniting this conversation. And as a brand, we said, oh, this is a great idea. I'll, I'll be able to infuse myself and my company and my quality products and services into the conversation so that I can actually help make a, make a purchase decision with these consumers. Well, this is what we ended up with, right? This explosion of social media and CMOs going, where the hell do I participate if I'm going to add value? How am I going to do this? So they started hiring people to be on every one of these platforms, figuring out what every new little logo meant that they were engaged in. They were measuring engagement, which I don't know what that means. I'm not sure, I don't know what the value of that is. It's great that I have engaged users, but do they buy my stuff? That's what I really want to know. So all of a sudden, we found ourselves very overwhelmed, and we had to start rethinking the social landscape. If we're going to find value here, how do we find the most value for the least amount of effort and the biggest return on investment? And this is when we started thinking about the influence pyramid, okay? The influence pyramid, essentially, on one axis here, you have frequency, right? Frequency of brand interest, okay? That's how often is my brand relevant to the consumer I'm going after. On this size, you have audience size, from one person to infinity, all of the consumers on the planet, okay? At the very top, you have you, the brand. Now, if you're a marketer, it's your brand. If you're a publisher, it's your brand. If, 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 you're, if it's a competitor, it's your competitor's brand you're thinking about at the top. Now, not very many people think about your brand every single day. The people in your office do, the people that, uh, that, you know, that work with you, your clients, your customers, your, your, your very, very uh, you know, valued partners think of you more often than everyone else. But it's not everyone in the world. Consumers don't think about you every day. And what consumer brands especially spend a huge amount of time and effort doing is trying to get their brand in the mind of the consumer, 93% of the population, as often as possible. Okay? This is expensive. Now, when you break down the social world and, and the online universe in general, you end up with these two tiers in the middle that are really valuable. There's one called the influencers, digital influencers specifically. These are people that create content online for a very valuable audience that actually move the market. So take TomTom, Tom, the GPS device manufacturer, all right? When we were working with TomTom, Tom, we realized that 1% of the population overall that we were looking at in the online universe, in fact, it was six people, six, a total of six, moved about 80% of the market, eight zero. 80% of the purchases were moved by six influential people. One of those people at gpsreviews.net would write a five to 8,000 word review of every single GPS that came on the market. And he was interested in TomTom, Tom, the brand at the top, more often than anyone else on the planet. If TomTom Tom had something to say, they he would listen. He wanted to know what it was. Because he's passionate and smart and thinking about this market every single day. There's a tier below the digital influencer, about 6 to 8% of the market, that are what we consider prosumers. These are consumers who are passionate about this industry or this market space or this thing or this, this uh, you know, um, hobby that they cared about what the digital influencers were writing so much that they would consume it. Does that make sense? So you've got digital influencers that create content, they, they lead the conversations online. They set the agendas, they, they write about the things they think are important to the community. The prosumer seeds the conversation. They'll argue, they'll uh, ask questions, but they'll, uh, you know, they'll shape their understanding of the universe through a conversation with the digital influencer. And at the end of the day, those influencers and prosumers help influence the rest of that market. The conversations that they have, that leading and seeding, ends up in consumers reading it. So I might be interested in buying a GPS device for my dad for his birthday, and I only want to spend $99, I don't want to spend a lot of money, and I don't know what to buy. I'm overwhelmed with the online opportunities, the offline opportunities. What do I buy? Well, I call my friend Jamie, who's a prosumer. He loves GPS devices. He reads the 8,000 word reviews. I say, Jamie, I got to buy my dad a GPS. What should I buy? He says, you should buy a TomTom. -tom. It's a $99. Easy to use. He'll love it. That's how the influence pyramid works. And as soon as brands start embracing this, we started to realize that there's a better way to move more of the market with less effort, energy, time, and money. And if we embrace these kinds of things, we start seeing real value. 
So that social media started to value the interaction overall over the impression. So that's an evolution, okay? We don't need the banner ad, display ad mentality to work for us. Let's value an interaction. Except we started to realize that being part of the conversation doesn't necessarily drive the most amount of revenue for us, okay? Does everybody, does anybody have any questions? Do I need to slow down? Okay, good. I'll keep going then. Let me get a sip of water. You can think about a question if you had one. All right. All right, this is the third and, and, uh, and current battle, I would say. This is the battle for content, okay? Have you guys been talking about content marketing a lot? Yes? Okay. So content marketing is, is on the forefront of a lot of minds, especially in the United States and other places I've visited. I was just in Singapore. And they were talking about content marketing um, in, a, in a very big way. There's a big Asian content marketing conference there. And there are brands, even in the B2B space, like Deloitte, who are creating what I call branded content. Okay? Now, brands, I don't think, are very good publishers. They don't know what the audience wants. They're not good at creating content that's audience-oriented. They're really good at creating content that's great for their brand. And this is a good example of this. This thing they call Deloitte Debates. You know what, as a, as, a, as a person who works in the business to business world, I'm not that interested in reading Deloitte debates. I already know it's going to come from a Deloitte perspective and how much value am I going to get. What they do do well is they call it framing the big decisions, okay? And even this piece of regularly scheduled content, which I think is a good thing, has a nice format. Like here's, they took on gamification. And what they're trying to get is CEOs to read these kinds of articles on a regular basis so that Deloitte is more, you know, top of mind. So that Deloitte is helping set the agenda for CEOs so that they walk into a meeting and go, guys, have we thought about gamification? And they look smart and sound smart. So what they do is they set up a little debate. Now that doesn't work as well as things that I consider content brands. All right. This are you guys familiar with Will It Blend? Raise your hand if you know Will It Blend. A few a few people. Okay. So Will It Blend, this big brand up here, is presented by Blendtec. You can't even see it. Okay. Will It Brand puts the content first and the brand second because they're trying to build a relationship with a very specific audience. Now, if you're marketing blenders, which is what Blendtec builds, Blendtec creates very expensive blenders, and they were in the, in the you know, professional market. They sold to restaurants and, and juice bars, and they wanted to get into the consumer market, but they don't have the budgets of Cuisinart and Oster and all these giant brands in the marketplace. So they, they, they were challenged with trying to figure out how do they get to the consumer they want to go after. And they realized a, a couple of interesting things. Number one, they realized that men only influence one kitchen purchase decision, only one, and that's a blender. Why is that? Because men treat a blender like a power tool. That's true. They're like, rrr, 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 rrr. That's, that's exactly what men think about a blender. And they realized that if, if we were going to sell blenders, we had to appeal to young males. Why young males? Because when they're going to register for the gifts they want for their wedding, they'll, they'll be in charge of getting a great blender. That's the one thing the wife can trust them with, is a power tool. So they decided they were going to start creating video content online. And their CMO was walking through the office with a bunch of clients one day, and they see the, their, their uh, head of, uh, of the company, the CEO, Tom Dixon, in the lab behind some glass. He's got some goggles on, and he was blending a crowbar. Blending a crowbar. And the, the, the client said, what the hell is, is Tom doing? And the CMO was brand new. He's like, I don't, I don't know. I've never seen him blend a crowbar before. So he asked some of the, the technical team. And the technical team says, Tom does this all the time. He wants to know if the blenders are powerful enough to blend a crowbar or a broomstick handle. And he'll shove anything in there. So all of a sudden, they get this brilliant idea. Every single week, they will release a new video online called Will It Blend? Now let me play a little bit for you. Will it blend? That is the question. This, this video actually is from the first day the I iPhone was released. IPhone. The very first it iPhone. Does everything. So will it blend? Tom Dixon that is the had an intern stand in line at an iPhone store. They'd been doing these videos for about six months. And he blended one of the first iPhones ever to be purchased and put it online. I, do you guys want to see the end? 
I'll let it play through for you. But essentially, they leveraged the audience of men that were already watching this, about 80,000 men who were getting these videos every week, who all of a sudden made this video the kind of highlight of their day. They sent it to all their friends, they ended up in the news media, and all of a sudden Will It Blend was a brand that other people were talking about. Not just because it had a powerful blender, in fact, they, no one talked about I that. Swear. They talked about the show, Don't Will It this. Blend. And all of a sudden, millions of men started watching Will It Blend every week. Today, still, even now, you five, fans seven years YouTube later, have asked me. Will, it, <laughs> Will It Blend is one of the number one channels on, or top 100 channels on YouTube, still watched by millions of, of people around the world. And all of a sudden, Will It Blend sold 500% more blenders in their market in one week than they'd ever sold before. And that's continued to this day. In fact, this brand is so big that you can go to a store like a Costco, a giant warehouse to distribution store in the United States, and they'll, on, on special days, they have the Will It Blend package, which is a signed t-shirt by Tom Dixon. You get the DVD of all the videos he's ever done. It's not about just the blender. It's about the content brand he created, the Will It Blend brand. People wear Will It Blend t-shirts. That's that's how powerful this brand has become. So that's a content brand. Here's another example, this one I gave yesterday. This is an example of Gary Vaynerchuk. Raise your hand if you don't know Gary Vaynerchuk. Don't know him, okay. So Gary Vaynerchuk inherited his father's uh, wine store, liquor store in New Jersey, okay. It's a $4 million a, liquor, a year liquor store in 2006, okay. And, and basically Gary wanted to bring the company into the 21st century and he said, I want to do something on the internet. And he decided he was going to do a video every single day where he would review three to five wines and then he would, he would uh, you know, help the consumer make a more educated decision. He decided to do this every day people. So he, made, he set an expectation. Let me play you the very s the second episode of Will It Blend. Uh, sorry. Of Hello everyone. There, Welcome to episode TV. two of Wine Library TV. I'm your host, Gary Vaynerchuk, Director of Operations. Today we are going to visit the wonderful and interesting world of Pinot Grigio. Pinot Grigio is... That doesn't sound interesting. This, this is like, se looks like terrible content. So Gary started distributing these online, and people were getting really angry. They hated his videos. They thought he was terrible. The wine snobs of the world told him he was an idiot. He didn't know anything about wine. He got a, On the 76th day, he had been doing the 76 days, he got an email from a real angry wine snob who said, Gary, your videos suck. You don't know anything about wine. You're just a sports jock who likes wine. And, and Gary was like, you know what? I am. I'm a sports jock who likes wine. Why aren't there more men who like to drink wine at tailgates for football games? Why aren't there more men who decide they're going to get into wine like, and drink it like they know beer? So all of a sudden, he changed his, his perspective. And he started actually delivering content that was more like a sports show for wine. Okay, so let me show you the second to last episode. By this time, he'd been doing this five years every single day, and his business had grown from a $4 million a year liquor store to a $60 million a year mail order business, just with this one piece of content, a content brand. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wine Library TV. I am your host, <laughs> Gary Vay, Nerd Chuck, and this, my friends, is the Thunder Show, aka the Internet's most passionate wine program. And so, today, like, th that sounds like a sports show, right? Show. I mean, that's today, and all of a sudden, ninety thousand people a week were watching this show. Ninety thousand people a week started ordering wine from him. That's how this became a content brand people trusted. And this is what built Wine Library TV. That's what built his business, was creating content that drove demand for the products he was selling. So as a marketer, usually I'm concerned with market share, right? And I spend a ton of time wondering if I'm beating my competitors in market share. So if this is 100% of my market, I'm trying to increase my market share by a little dot at a time so I can take my market just a little bit more from 10% to 11% and get $11 of my $100 market. Right? This kind of thinking isn't very good thinking unless you're thinking about just raising awareness. This is an awareness play. 
And CMOs are starting to realize that I can't just focus on just raising awareness any, anymore. It's harder and harder to do this in a cluttered landscape where people use influence, like the influence pyramid, to drive demand. I have to start rethinking my model. So what if I just start worrying about increasing market share instead of market, my, I'm sorry, market size instead of market share? What if I take my 10% market share and it stays 10%, but I make the market a $200 market or a $300 market? Does my CFO care if I beat out the competition or do they really care that I drive more revenue? And if you start thinking like this, if you say I want to increase demand for wine in men or I want to increase the, the demand for blenders in men, all of a sudden you're the one that can benefit from an increase in the market size. This is not an awareness play. And we used to tell our clients, if you want to raise awareness, buy ads. Buy lots of them. It might work. But if you want to increase demand, you've got to underwrite content. You've got to work with people who understand their audience to actually drive real revenue by underwriting content that increases demand for the products you sell. And this is where native advertising has a foothold. All of a sudden, we're telling brands, like this is from Forbes, right? And in the US, people love Forbes' native advertising. They think it's awesome. This is from Northwestern Mutual Voice, overcoming money, money shock from blah, blah, blah. I don't care. I don't know who it's by. I can tell it's by a brand. I don't think it adds much value. It doesn't build a real relationship with the audience. These are the problems that, that native advertising doesn't really solve. It's an answer to the need of the advertiser, but it's not a long-term play. It's not a new revenue model. We have to start thinking about harnessing the power of a subscription. Because content values relationships over impressions and conversation. And if you own the relationship, you own the customer. So high quality, long-term relationships are the most valuable. You don't want fly-by-night impressions. You don't want you know, meaningless engagement with a minimum of a, a small amount of the users. You want, you want to win the battle to be attached to your content in a deeper way and find new opportunities to drive new revenue. All right, so those are the three battles. I think one of the big opportunities here is actually to think about cutting out the middlemen. In the US alone, $35 billion a year is paid to ad agencies for creative work. $35 what if that $35 billion a year started going into your pockets? $9 billion a year is spent on PR agencies creating PR campaigns designed to do exactly what you're able to do, which is increase demand for the products and services in the marketplace. What if we start thinking about taking on that kind of money? the battle to be part of the content instead of just be next to it or part of the conversation. Let me talk to you about the power of content, all right? This is, this is Finding Nemo. You guys, has anyone not seen Finding Nemo? Man, I will talk to you at lunch. <laughs> Finding Nemo is a great movie, a great movie. It did $868 million at the box office, which obviously is pretty good, and it's still the best-selling DVD of all time, okay? It, Frozen just surpassed it uh, in revenue, but not in DVD sales, because I don't know who the hell is buying DVDs. Uh, so this is, <laughs> this is really valuable content. And I took my niece, six weeks after she saw Finding Nemo, I took my six-year-old niece to a pet store in a mall in the United States, and she walked around saying, I want a Nemo. I want, is that a Nemo? Is that, I think that's a dory fish. And this is amazing, because how can you say no to this face? It's impossible. It's impossible. So now my uncle, my, my, my niece and my, my brother-in-law now own a clownfish. And this is what happened. Finding Nemo def decimated the global population of clownfish. It's not a joke. People flew to Australia, took clownfish out of the anemones and brought them back to sell them to your kids. And you don't just buy a clownfish, right? You have to buy all this other junk to keep that clownfish alive. So all of a sudden, a $7 fish costs 90 bucks, 150 bucks, depending on what you buy. If you buy the treasure chest with the bubbles, all of a sudden it's 140 bucks. This is what happens. And it doesn't just sell clownfish. It sells all sorts of other fish, dory fish, turtles, anything that appeared in the movie saw an increase in demand after the movie for pets. This, this is what happens. You can still go 10, 10 years later to Walmart and you can still buy yourself a Finding Nemo starter kit aquarium because it inspires that moment where you first saw Finding Nemo and you want a fish again. It's not the first time Disney's done this. 101 Dalmatians, when it came out in 1961, created an adoption crisis because people realized very quickly that Dalmatians make really crappy pets if you have kids. 
So they sent them back. This kind of content inspires demand. This is how it works. The, uh, you, do you guys use Google Trends? Raise your hand if you use Google Trends or Google Insights. Okay, yeah, this is, that's good. This is good for a group. Uh, uh, th that doesn't usually happen. Uh, I'm glad you know it. So Google Trends is, I think, the most undervalued marketing tool on the planet. All right, this, this tool can help show you where demand opportunities lie and how to take advantage of them as a first mover. This is demand for clownfish from 2005 to today. In 2005, a year after the movie was released, it's still at 100%. 100, like the, the top, right, of demand. Then it cycles down a little bit. There's this offshoot. And then there's a cyclical nature to demand for clownfish. Then all of a sudden, the DVD is released in April of 2011. What happens? Demand for clownfish shoot up again. All of a sudden, people are interested in clownfish. And there are tank manufacturers going, I don't know, we're selling a lot of tanks out there. <laughs> I don't know why. It's like 2004 all over. That's what happens. Valuable content increases demand for the products and services your clients sell. That's the opportunity. So you have to start thinking about this rising tide and how can we build a business model that rewards us for the activity our editorial inspires, our clients' content inspires. We're not rewarded for the impact we have in the marketplace and we've got to start embracing those opportunities and creating those opportunities in an online world. I think if you're going to do that, you have to build content brands and unbundle your brand. This is the concept we talked about in the workshop yesterday. But I come from the television world, all right? And in the television world, th this is Discovery Network, okay? Discovery Network doesn't market fast and loud their TV show as the Discovery Channel. They market fast and loud the TV show. They want anyone who's interested in cars to watch fast and loud. It happens to be on the Discovery Channel. So if you want to find it, it's on the Discovery Channel. But they market the brand, the content brand. This is, this is what their website for Fast and Loud looks like. They want you to get into Fast and Loud as deep as possible. And if you're interested, there's other shows on Discovery Channel. But if I can own you just one moment of your day, I want to own you. CNBC started as just a network about what's happening on the market today. They used to just report from the floor of the Wall Street uh, uh, Stock Exchange. And that's not the case anymore. They realized they had to make appointments with their audience, create content like Mad Money with Jim Cramer or Squawk Box in the Morning, where you could make an appointment with formatted content so they could own you as an audience instead of just having you come in and out, which is how we treat our web pages today. Instead, can we build a relationship that's much deeper than that? CNBC has gotten so hooked on this idea that they've changed their primetime lineup to be entertainment-oriented content because they want to attract a new audience, uh, maybe an audience that's into business but wants to know about famous people that have stolen lots of money, like American Greed. This is, these are content brands that happen to be on CNBC, but they build a relationship with the consumer. So I want you to start asking yourself, what if your brand was a TV network? What would the shows that you produce be? What shows would you produce if your brand was a TV network instead of just one brand? And how can you build deeper relationships with a different kind of content? All right. Sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead. You guys doing okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, whoops. I don't want to run out of time. <laughs> I, had, I only have 180 slides. I thought I'd get through them all. Three, three secrets to building content brands, all right? Let me, let me walk through these for you. The first one is to get rich by targeting a niche, okay? Now, niches are more and more valuable in the online universe, and too many media brands, even television media, has taken a large-scale approach to trying to get a high volume of, of watchers or consumers of content. And I think in the online world, the biggest opportunities lie very deep. This is a fractal. Okay, if you don't know what a fractal is, it's just a self-similar repeating pattern where the pattern above it looks exactly like the one uh, you know, below it. So you can go to infinity and it always looks the same. I'll show you what this means. This is a fractal and I'm going to take my audience and divide it and divide it until I find value in the marketplace. This is for a company called Farmers, uh, Tractor Supply. Okay? And they sell to farmers, you would think, because they sell tractors. Tractor Supply is a $5.3 billion business. 5.3 billion. They have 1,400 stores in the United States, and it's like a giant, a giant warehouse of stuff to buy if you own a farm. Fences, overalls, tractors, it doesn't matter. So farmers is, one, is the trunk of the tree. But if you just divide that audience once, 
to, between commercial farmers and hobby farmers, it all of a sudden looks very different. Commercial farmers need to be spoken to in a different way. Hobby farmers don't. Hobby farmers just farm on the weekend. They've got a day job, but commercial farmers do this every day and they need to back their truck up and buy 500 pounds of whatever you're selling, not one little bag. So let's go down the hobby farmer tree. If you go down the hobby farmer tree, now hobby farmer is the trunk, and you've got rural hobby farmers that live in the country or suburban ones that live close to a metropolitan area which happens to be near your stores. So let's go down the suburban hobby farmer. And if you go down that one tree, now you've got a new tree with the suburban hobby farmers who like to grow corn as on the agricultural tree or livestock on the other branch. Okay, let's go down the suburban hobby farmer who likes to raise some livestock. There's big livestock, like a pig. Maybe I have two pigs in the backyard for the 4-H fair. Or maybe I have small ones like rabbits or chickens. So now we're at the small hobby farmer who lives in a suburban area that's into chickens. Okay? And at the chicken tree, there's a valuable audience that's all into backyard poultry. And it's run by a guy named Andy Schneider who started this trend. Andy Schneider is known as the chicken whisperer. Okay? And, and he's a very credible guy because he wrote a book called The Chicken Whisperer's Guide to Keeping Chickens. It's the number one best-selling chicken whispering book on Amazon. If you're interested, you can, you can buy yourself a copy. But what's really interesting about Andy is he started an online radio show. He has an online radio show for two hours every day, four days a week, people. You can call in and listen to The Chicken Whisperer. You can tune in online. He has a schedule that he keeps with guests every week. They talk about, you know, on Monday if the doctor's on, they talk about the fact that your chicken got frostbite and how do you fix it. That's really what they talk about. Two hours a day, people, and it's very popular. 20,000 people every week tune into his show, into the Chicken Whisperer show. It's an international audience, by the way. So he has people all over the world that call in. And it's not just an online radio show. He created a series of meetup groups, physical groups, in some of the major metropolitan areas, suburban areas, where you can go meet your buddies who also have a backyard poultry problem. They have 1,850 people in Austin meet once a month. Not all 1,800 show up, but it's a very popular program. He has his fans on Facebook. He talks about nothing but chickens, right? And all of a sudden, you see Tractor Supply is involved. Why is Tractor Supply involved? Tractor Supply was interested in creating content that was unique and different in the marketplace that inspired people to go out and buy a little baby chick for $1.50 and then spend 400 bucks to raise that chick. That's what they wanted to do. So they started working with him and instead of using generic content, they decided to actually create video content that was really about how to raise a chicken. And they didn't stop there. They decided that they have chick days every spring, okay? And at chick days, they invite people to come to Tractor Supply and buy their chicken on a special day before Easter or before some of the holidays. And all of a sudden, guess who's appearing? The Chicken Whisperer. He's going on tour. The Chicken Whisperer goes on tour to about 40 Tractor Supplies every year. And he, he shows up and he does a four-hour program, two-hour program. He does his live radio show from the store, from his RV, from a camper. And all of a sudden, people show up. This is Anderson, South Carolina. Look at that. 150 people showed up in Anderson. How about Mobile, Alabama? This is, this is crazy because 300 people showed up and they had to rent a hall because they can't fit 300 people in the back of their store. It takes up too much space. Does it drive revenue? That's what Tractor Supply really cares about. Yes, it does. If you just take the feed, just chicken feed alone, and you take one store, that's $21,000 in chicken feed alone. If you multiply that times the 40 stores he goes to, times 10 years, which is the life of the chickens and uh, you know, the average that they keep them, that's all of a sudden $8.6 million in just chicken feed in new customers who are introduced to Tractor Supply who now have a need, a desire, and a demand to keep coming back. Impressions don't matter to them. They don't care. They actually are interested in underwriting brand, Andy's, Andy Schneider's content that actually drives demand. This is the same thing that Red Bull does. They believe in underwriting. In fact, they underwrite 500 athletes in 97 niche sports. A hundred of them just are in the US, but that's the same concept I'm asking you to embrace. Can you find ways to go so deep in a niche that you've got and own a subscriber base that's worth going after? Something so deep on your tree that's small chicken, livestock loving, hobby farmer that lives in a suburban area? That's how deep I want you to go. So I want you to start dividing and subdividing your audience to get rich by targeting a niche. All right. 
Let me give you my, my last two. I want you to explore niches, okay? I want you to stop trying to be everything to everyone, even on your buy and sell markets. Think about how you could spin off markets that might provide more value to the right people. Ask yourself, who are the chicken whisperers in your market? Do they exist? Can you go after them? All right, I've only got a few minutes left. Uh, we're going to we're gonna have to have a face-off between secrets two and three. <laughs> Let me do, I'll do, I think I can actually do this one faster. This one's about content holes. I want you to think about exploiting content holes. This is content that your audience doesn't know they want until they get it, okay? This is, I learned about this in Columbia, South Carolina in the United States. In 1993, there was that cable television explosion in the United States. And people said, how can we watch 200 channels? That's impossible. We don't need 200 channels on television. So all of a sudden, this guy, Dale Ordine, in Columbia, South Carolina, he gets access to the Sci-Fi Network. Now, the Sci-Fi Network was brand new, and you had to pay extra for that. So Sci-Fi Network was going to air Star Trek reruns and science fiction movies, and, and he had to get people to sign up. So he got a bunch of people to sign up to this. And he's, he's about to put it live on a Friday night at 8 o'clock. He had advertised to all these people, you've got to tune in at 8 o'clock. And all of a sudden, he gets a call at 4 p.m. on Friday from the FCC, the Communications Commission, that says, you cannot put it live. You don't have the right signatures. You're going to have to you know, tell your viewers you can't see it. Should take us six weeks. So he doesn't know what to do. He's got a few hours. So he rolls a camera into his office, and he points it at a fish tank. And he lets the fish tank go live. And the fish tank is on for, for six weeks, six months. No one calls. And he thinks, well, I, I got the Star Trek deal. I thought everybody was excited about it. Why is no one calling and complaining that there's fish on the sci-fi network? So he finally, six months later, gets the approval to put the sci-fi channel live. He puts the sci-fi channel live, and guess what happens? People call up and complain, and they say, I want my fish TV back. That is a premium network. I pay for my fish channel. Where is it? That is a content hole. No one said, I want a fish TV network to watch. So in the online universe of 53 billion indexed web pages, I want you to start finding your own fish TVs. In every one of those categories you sell a product in, you have to start looking for those content holes, content they didn't know they wanted that could increase demand for what you sell. The fish network went on for six years. They put it on, the, on a new TV network, and people paid extra to watch fish TV. That's powerful. So I want you to explore your content holes. All right, I am so sorry. I put too much together for you guys. I apologize. I'm out, am I out of time, Peter? Two minutes. Two minutes. I got two minutes. I can get you one last one. I can get you secret number three, which is make an appointment with your audience. This is an easy one. You want to start considering owning just one piece of a consumer's day. If you can own two minutes of a day, that's worth millions to a consumer brand. Millions. This is what you, I want you to think about. This is Say Media, and it's a media company that's trying to get marketers to buy display advertising. So they want strategic thinking marketers to, to subscribe to an email every single week, right? I get an email from a buddy who says, have you seen that Friday is Venday? And I'm like, what? Friday is, Friday is Venday? What the hell does that mean? I didn't know Friday. No one told me Friday was Venday. They made an appointment with their call to action. And all of a sudden, I start looking at their content. And their content is very different. That's what their Venn diagrams look like. All of a sudden, they've got this innovative kind of hook, something that's different about the content that makes me want to consume this content. I see that. I read the article. I say, this is great content. And I sign up for Venday. Every Friday at 7.58 AM, I get an email with a new Venn diagram and a strategic thinking article every Friday. They own 7.58 AM in my world. This is the kind of thing they sent. When we landed on Mars in the US, there was this big you know, deal about this guy's hair. And all of a sudden, they were talking about it. What's the overlap? This is what they do when they're talking about mobile advertising, this kind of context you know, over advertising awareness. So 7.58 AM every Friday, no matter what I'm doing, when I see that subject line, this week in Venn, in my inbox, I kind of stop, and, and I go, this is great content. I'm going to stop reading boring emails from idiots who want to reply. I'll read this. 
And now I've got an appointment every single week with them. So I want you to consider, what if you just tried to own some quality time in your audience's inbox? What if you ignored click-through rates and your goal was just a zero opt-out rate? What time in your audience's life can you own? All right, guys. Thank you so much. You've been drewed. <laughs> Thanks, Drew. That was fun. OK. Questions to my friend from Boston. Questions? We're not, I just learned last night you're not supposed to ask Finnish people if they have any questions. <laughs> you have Martha right here. Oh, hey, Martha. Yesterday you shared a tip on how to, look, how to connect um, what type of uh, revenues you can tie to content branding, how to look for it in trends. Can you describe that again? Yes, what was that? <laughs> well, you said go, you know, tie. The consumer you, journey? No. Well, you go in Google Trends oh. and you try different products and see, you know, oh, what the yes. trend is so you could go I after gotcha. the right. Okay. Yeah, so, so one of the great, uh, so I, I, you know, I came out of television and then I started a marketing and advertising agency called Tipping Point Labs, which I ran for 12 years. And our concept there was to, if you want to sell uh, really big ideas to brands, you have to keep the measurements and metrics very simple. And if the measurements and metrics are always focused on driving revenue, it's much easier to sell than anyone else. You will beat everyone in the marketplace. If you don't care about engagement and click-throughs and impressions, and you just start to talk to them about how you can increase demand for the products they sell. And the best, most simple way to do this is to actually leverage Google Trends. You can look at every brand that they compete with on Google Trends, and within a few percentage points, you can actually dis discern their market share. Uh, they don't have to do fancy ass surveys and spend a lot of money. You can tell them what their market share is. Second to that, you can actually leverage those b peaks and charts, just like the fish one, to determine what increased demand in the marketplace. If, they, if, if there was a big article about them in the local newspaper and you see that demand increased, then what was that article about? Because if you can replicate that experience on an ongoing basis, you can actually increase demand over time. So Google Trends, even it always has a corollary to revenue. It's not one to one, sometimes it's 0.2 to one, but there's always a way to correlate the activity in Google to that, to, to uh, revenue. And what's, the reason this is actually goes back to what Martha was saying. We live in a Galilean web world, right? You guys remember Ptolemy, the guy who thought that the, the Earth was the center of the universe? Okay, brands for the last 15 years have thought they are the center of the universe. They, they think like Ptolemy. They think, well, I gotta measure my click-throughs on my website, and how do we get them to my website? And I need them to come, what if they don't get to my website? I need them, I gotta measure my click-through. It's idiotic, because what you really want people to do is to buy more stuff. Do you really care if they go to your website? What you really want, the, I don't care if you ever come to my website. There, we have B2B people who sell, one guy sold a $2 million account and the client never went to the website, they just called him on the phone. Oh, wow. That's a, well, how, how do I track that? The, the, you have to focus on the big key elements. The Ptolemaic model of the world has changed. And in the Galilean model, you know, Galileo kind of revolutionized the world when he said the sun was the center of the universe and we circle around it. Well, that's what Google searches. At the middle of the, the, today's online universe is Google, right? And, and at the very center, it, it, that's where people start and finish their day. And then around you know, that, that search sun are all the planets that your co consumers and clients spend a lot of time. It might be Facebook, it might be Twitter, we saw what it is, right? Pinterest, it, it might be uh, a blog they like, it might be their mom's blog, who the hell knows? But these are things close to the center of their universe. And where's your brand or where's their brand? It's way the fuck over here. They come out to us through all the stuff you like. I'm Pluto in the middle. Like that, that's what happens. So you got, we got to start embracing the fact that the closer we get to the consumer and the closer we focus just on demand generation for the, what they sell, the more successful you'll be. You'll drive tons of revenue that way. Did that answer your question?